Would you come minister the word unto the Lord unto us? Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. I am so excited to be here tonight with you in the freshness of God's presence and the life and the energy of the worshipers that are here. And I just love your name, Tabernacle of Joy. I think that's so cool because you just check your garments of heaviness at the door and you pick up your garment of praise as you walk in. And no matter what happened when you got, before you got here, you can say, well, thank you, Jesus. I'm at Tabernacle of Joy, so I got to be happy. <laughs> Praise God. You all have been so gracious, so kind. I appreciate Pastor Tim so very, very much uh, being such a generous and gracious host. The condo that I'm staying at is lovely and beautiful. And appreciate Brother and Sister Dabs. They are just fine people, great people of God. And I'm so glad that you got to meet them and they got to meet you. And they're tapping into what's going on in the spiritual realm in this area. And they've got me all stirred up talking about stuff I wasn't even planning on talking about. And made me feel better about myself than I really am. And just uh, treating, everyone's treating me with so much respect and kindness. And I just feel unworthy of it, but thank you very, very much. I have a couple more seeds I'm going to sow and uh, get ready to run or jump or raise your hand or something. I'm going to give this to somebody here tonight. This is an awesome series that I did. On, uh, we did a little miniature prayer seminar in our church when we uh, based at Brother Richard Flowers Church, the church that Chad Flowers is from. And by the way, he sends his love to everybody here at Tabernacle of Joy. I told him I was coming to Singapore and he was so jealous. He just about hit me. But anyway, um, but they, they want to come back. Maybe they'll come for DCD uh, this year. But uh, uh, <laughs> he said, I really want to take about a month and just go back to Singapore with my wife and, and let her see what Singapore is all about. He just loves you all so much. But uh, we did a Saturday morning special intercessors prayer deal, and I did two messages. One is called How to Get Your Virtue Back. And this message is basically the principle of virtue that as you operate in faith, virtue flows out of you. Jesus, was he was ministering, the woman with the issue of blood touched him and the virtue went out. Well, he said, I'm going to wait till the virtue comes back before I go and raise the dead at Jairus' house. A lot of times we go on without the virtue and pray anyway, and that's why nothing happens. We have to learn how to get the virtue back, and that's what this is about, how to keep your virtue perpetually being restored in your life. And then the second one is a message that I did um, at, uh, I chose this version of it. I, I preached this at uh, a camp meeting in Colorado on the last night of camp meeting. And I call this a little taste of honey. When you're in the battle, a lot of times we won't allow ourselves to really rejoice until we uh, get total victory. At the end of this first message, I started to talk about this just a little bit. But the second message, I expanded into a whole message. And it, it's, it's just a, a revelation that you need to stop and take a praise break every time you get a little bit of victory. Don't wait till everything you want happens before you worship, or you may never get to worship. But every time God does something good in your life, just stop and take a praise break. Thank you, Lord. The battle turned. It's not all over yet, but something shifted and the momentum's going my way. Woo. I'm going to take a praise break. <laughs> praise God. Praise God. We might need to have a prayer of healing for <laughs> Honor your elders. You know. <laughs> Praise God. Maybe the next one I just need to hand to somebody. Okay. But I believe we need restoration, and uh, that's what God wants to do to keep us energized and alive. This one is a message that came um, over 15 years ago, and I was describing an angelic experience that I had um, 
several years ago, and after the angel left, I got three messages. One of those messages was very, very intense. And when I began to talk to the Lord about it, I said, Lord, if I preach this, they will kill me. And the Lord said, just tell them I told you to preach it. And I said, well, Lord, you know, some people don't really buy into that idea. That, you know, they don't really think that you speak like this. And then he got angry with me. The, the audacity of me to challenge what he was saying. And I said, and he said, you just, he said, um, he said, I will give you my anointing and they will not touch you. I said, okay, you give me the anointing, that's enough. <laughs> then I waited 15 years <laughs> before I really felt the relief. I preached parts of this, but I never had the opportunity to preach it the way that God gave it to me until I was at Landmark Conference a couple of years ago. We had about 5,000 people there. I have this on CD and on DVD. But this is a message called, Are You a Voice or an Echo? The essence of it is that the golden calf represents the spirit of religious tradition. And that Aaron established it because he was just an echo. When Moses went up into the mountain, Moses was the voice. When he was in Egypt, it's okay. It's okay to be the echo in Egypt because we're all supposed to speak the same thing to the world. When it comes time to being progressive and moving on with God as the cloud moves and as God's taking us to where we're wanting to go, we can't just be echoes. We have to have our own contact with God. And so the question is, are you a voice or an echo? And are you ready to move on to your promised land? Amen. So I want to give this to somebody that wants to be relevant and keep on moving with the Lord. Come on. Leave him alone. Okay, there you go. God bless you. Praise God. All right, I don't want to, uh, okay, it's 8, 10 right now. All right. Stopwatches are turned on. Let's go. Okay, the book of Matthew, chapter number 25. And this is a foundational message for what's going to happen um, and what is happening in the spirit. I am... I'm going to speak a word to you tonight, a relevant word in the spirit that is defining what God is doing now and what he is about to do. With this comes an impartation of the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And tomorrow I am anticipating that we will use this anointing. Okay? So come back if you can. Bring people with you, and tomorrow we will, we will use it together. But tonight we want to impart it and explain it. Matthew 25, then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened. We're teaching, so I'll let you remain seated. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil, notice, in their vessels. Everyone say, in their vessels. With their lamps. So, or in addition to the oil that was in the lamp. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. This is not the rapture. Okay? This is preparation for the rapture, but it's not the rapture. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there not be enough for us and you, but go you rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. Here's the rapture. And they, were, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgin, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. And he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. I'm going to talk to you tonight about anointed for the future. Anointed for the future. Would you lift your hands? Would you lift your voices? Would you pray? 
for the spirit of revelation, for the spirit of faith, and for a impartation from the Holy Ghost to come to you tonight. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, I ask you to bring us into the flow of revelation, understanding in the Holy Ghost. Father, I pray tonight that the gift of faith will be released in this house, that there can be impartation to these people, and that they may comprehend exactly, that we may all comprehend, that I may comprehend, oh God, the gravity of this hour and the excitement of what you are doing and what you are about to do. In Jesus' name, tap us in to the future and let it pull us, oh God, with such force that it will be as if we have never lived in the past. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Everyone say, in Jesus' name. Say it again. Say it one more time. Now, let's all clap our hands to the Lord. First of all, we understand that a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And it parallels things that we understand to teach us things that we do not understand. It mirrors things in the natural world so that we can comprehend the spiritual world. Everything that is physical and natural first came out of that which was spiritual and invisible. And so God uses things in our daily lives to teach us when the Spirit of the Lord touches us. Then it gives meaning to the mundane. Jesus is teaching his disciples and he is giving powerful, intense, and graphic details of the future. He is giving them prophetic insights of what is about to immediately take place in Jerusalem and then things that pertain to the end of the world and to his second coming. And then as he begins to wrap up chapter 24, of course the divisions were added later, he begins to tell stories. And he uses the story to kind of encapsulate the truths that he just gave them so that they would be able to remember them. They'll be able to attach it to a story. That's what the, why the Bible has so many stories in it. Because if I just try to give you a truth, but I don't give a face or a personality to that truth, then you, you can lose it. It's in there somewhere, but you have to connect it to something in your mind. That's how human beings are made. So God did that in, the, in His Word, and Jesus did this in His teaching and in His prophesying. He attached it to a story. And so He understood their references uh, in their culture to marriage and he also was coming to get a bride and so he uses this as the backdrop for telling the stories about the coming of the Lord now basically what we're seeing here is that there was a process there was an engagement which was a legal contract that you entered into in which the rabbi would bring you together and you would hold hands and then they would take this uh, piece of cloth that they would that they would put over the hands and then they would say uh, the, the contract before the parents and sign the contract and they were legally bound to be as they were as spouse that was a legal th action that was done that was not the same as maybe we see in Western civilization maybe perhaps even how it is here uh, but uh, where, where you say it's an engagement but it's not exactly legal until you're married it was legal when you got engaged but then there was a process in which they went through a certain ritual in which the, the bride would remain with the bridesmaids and, and then the bridegroom would go off to his house and then there would be feasts that were preparations that were made and then he would make sure that his house was ready and then the bridegroom would, 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 would come forth at an unspecified time 
And the bridesmaids were supposed to go as a representative of the bride and go and meet the bridegroom. And then together, all the bridesmaids would take the bridegroom back to the bride's house. And then they would have a grand procession where the bridesmaids with the bridegroom and the bride, and they would all walk into the bridegroom's house. And there was the canopy where they would, where they would complete the wedding ceremony. And then they would have seven days of feasting. So what Jesus is telling us here is that there were bridesmaids who are representatives of the bride. And five were foolish and five were wise. Now what does this mean inside the context of the church? What truths is he speaking to his apostles? He is saying that there is going to be a euphoria that takes place when the church is birthed. That euphoria is the engagement. It's the legal action of us coming into covenant relationship with God. God has begun the process of bringing himself a bride, born of the water and born of the spirit. We already have his name. We have already been spoken for. We are no longer available for another suitor because we already have one. Touch somebody and say, I'm already spoken for. You have a new last name. However you were born in this world, when you went down in water in the name of Jesus, you came up with a brand new name. You have the last name Jesus. And you entered into a legal covenant with Almighty God that hell has to recognize. I don't have my hands on you anymore. I can't hold you anymore. You're not available anymore. He's not allowed to flirt with you without getting in trouble with Jesus. <laughs> and so there is what I call the universal church or the universal bride, which is the composite of all the saints. Okay. Then there is what we call the local bride or the local church. Jesus was walking in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks in the book of the Revelation. That is him walking in the midst of the universal church. The church as a composite of all of the local churches, of all the local groups, of all the people all around the world that are the constituents that make up the body of Christ. Jesus walks in the midst of them all. They all belong to him. They all have His Spirit. They all have His name. They all hear from Him. They all know Him. They all worship Him. And they interact. But then He one by one addresses each one of those local churches and says, I have this against you, and I have this against you, and I have this against you. What we are seeing here is a contrast between universal church and local church. Universal truth, universal revelation, universal possibility. And then local grasping culture, limitation, focus, and ideas. And what he is saying is Calvary purchased for you more than what you are operating in. So I have this against you. There is revelation that you have not accessed yet that I want you to have. I want you to move from your regional perspective of me and operate by the universal code that I have established for all of my people. This is what, what Paul was talking about in the book of Ephesians chapter 3 when he said that you may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height to know the love of God which passeth knowledge why that she might be filled with all the fullness of God these are people that already have the Holy Ghost these are people that already have the name of Jesus they already have covenant relationship and from what we know historically about the church in Ephesus it was one of the greatest churches that was in existence at that time. Yet Paul said there is fullness from Jesus that you don't yet have. There's breadth that you haven't gone. There's, there, there's length. There's depth. There's height. There's dimensions that you've never been involved with. And don't think just because you're a revival church. And don't think just because you already have the Holy Ghost. And don't think just because you have a little bit of revelation that you've got all of it. I am praying that you'll be able to comprehend what is the universal access of all saints. 
This is what he told the church in Corinth. That you come behind in no gift. He told the church in Romans that the Roman church that he wanted to perfect what was lacking in their faith. There were things that were missing out of the local churches because there's something that the cross has purchased universal truth, universal revelation. And this ought to be the passion of every local body. They ought to be leaning forward, always anticipating the next thing that God is about to show, the next thing that God is about to reveal. But Jesus said that there would be local bodies that would be foolish and local bodies that would be wise. There would be people that would be representatives of that bride and they would all be kind of clustered together. And we wouldn't really be able to know the difference between those that were wise and foolish in the beginning stage. Because everybody was coming out of the same euphoria of the engagement. The euphoria of the book of Acts church. The euphoria of Pentecost, cloven tongues of fire, sounds from heaven. People from everywhere, all around the world hearing about this. Samaria, and then Cornelius' house, and then the uttermost parts of the world. The apostle Paul, and Barnabas, and Antioch, and whew, churches just coming up and mushrooming everywhere. And 35 years of intense apostolic ministry of the apostle Paul in the known world had been penetrated even the very heart of Rome so much so that the house of Caesar had those that were saluting the church saying we're also believers the euphoria of engagement the excitement of the launching of the church but that is not the most significant event but the Bible says that there would be a lull there was a stage. You see, there was dancing at the engagement. There was dancing. There was, there was celebration at the engagement. And then the bridegroom goes away. And then there's that, that relax. Of, oh, wow. Well, that was exciting. Okay, well, okay, ladies, are you ready to go and get the bridegroom? Yeah. Do you know when he's coming? No. Go get him. Okay. Do you have your torches? We have our torches. All right. Well, I'll see you when I see you. Okay. <laughs> By the way, darling, you look lovely. Thank you. And so they go. I've done a little bit of research on these lamps. I wanted to know what they were. There's a little bit of controversy. Any wonder? You know, the Bible sheds a little light on those commentaries. <laughs> anyway, that's a joke. <laughs> commentaries get us more confused about the word sometimes and better just to read the Bible. But <clears throat> I'm trying to understand what these lamps were so I can understand what's really happening here. I've seen lithographs that they, that they, uh, that they made representing how they would travel on those dark roads at times. Now, some of the commentaries say that they were torches, that they would wrap a rag soaked in oil on this torch, and then they would carry it. And I guess in some of the Greek and the Roman ceremonies that they, this was, was customary for them to wrap them, but that would only burn for about 15 minutes. And then you'd have to wrap another rag again with oil, and then it would burn another 15 minutes. Now, if these people slumbered and slept, uh, it didn't just say they slept, it said they slumbered and they slept. And they, they had oil that they trimmed their lamps down, and then it seems that they turned their lamps back up. It doesn't fit the profile in the Bible. What I've seen in these lithographs was another form of lamps, which was a long pole that bent forward with a little hook. And then there was this little, uh, this little some kind of a, a vessel with, with a holes on the side that where the light would come out. And then there was a wick, and the oil would be poured in around the wick. And they would light the wick, and then it, it, would, uh, it, it could burn for a couple of hours like that. And then they would stretch them out in front of themselves, and, and, and that would help them see where they were going. See, they didn't have street lamps and all that kind of thing. And when the sun went down, I mean, it was, you couldn't see where you were going. You had to have light just to walk. And so because the festivities were kind of ending at the end of the day, the dancing is done, the bridegroom, he's gone back to his house, 
And uh, now the darkness is here and they go out to go and meet the bridegroom. They have to have some way to get to where they're going, to get to the connection point of the next greatest event that's about to happen. And so the foolish virgins say, oh, it won't be very long. We'll just take the oil that's already in the lamp and that will be enough. But the wise virgins took a vessel, the Bible says, along with their lamp. They allowed themselves to carry something that was cumbersome. Something that was not allowed to be used or was not at this point needed to be used on their journey. But it was in their mind a necessity to bring this extra oil. To the foolish virgins, it was an option. And it was an option that they did not choose. Because they were still thinking in temporary mode. They were still in the festivities and the excitement and the, oh, it's no big deal. It won't be very long. We'll just go from one little dancing to another dancing and one ceremony to another and one little feast to another feast. And they did not take into consideration that there might be a longer delay than what they thought. And what Jesus was saying is that there would come a point in between significant spiritual events in which there would be a, a lull or a period of dormancy that would come to the church. And he is preparing the people. Just because there's a period of dormancy does not mean that things are not happening. It just means that you're not quite connected to them yet. But if you plan on being a part of what God is working on, and you plan on being a part of this great illustrious future that's about to unfold, then you have better be leaning forward instead of leaning backwards. There was a dividing line that came to those virgins when there was a midnight cry, that's when there was a distinction that was made between foolish and between wise. Because the foolish were defined by where they had just been, but the wise were defined by where they were about to go. One was defined by an oil that could get them to where they were, but could go no further. And the others were defined by anointing that they were just getting ready to use. And so what Jesus was saying in this parable is, make sure you are not a foolish virgin. Make sure that you are connected with the full measure of grace that is available and that you are constantly anticipating what I am about to do. That you are not being defined by your present circumstance. You are not defined by where you have just been. You are not defined by yesterday. You can't walk around and say, well, the anointing we had 10 years ago, that was enough for us then, it's enough for us now. Is it? You don't drive the same car. You don't wear the same clothes. You don't have the same hairdo. Well, why don't you do Well, it's like the man telling his wife, you know, well, honey, do you love me? I told you 30 years ago, I love you. If I ever decide anything different, I'll let you know. <laughs> Folks, you know, this is, this is, we can't do this in our relationship with God. Well, I spoke in tongues 10 years ago and that the Lord, I know me and the Lord got it going on. Everything's all right. Y'all just pray for me that I make it all the way. Folks, we have got to live constantly in step with the Spirit and keep on leaning forward. Thank you, God, for what you've done. Thank you where you brought us. I, I, I'm excited about the euphoria of, uh, uh, of being engaged. But you know what? There's another event coming. We're about to have the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're going to get to go to New Jerusalem. We're going to get out of this whole world. I'm just a pilgrim and a stranger. I am not getting my hopes all set on this earth. If in this life only we had hope in Christ, we would be of all men most miserable. I feel a little miserable sometimes because I just can't find what I'm looking for. But I realize I'm looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. I'm looking for something that this world can't give me. I've got my heart set on something else because I've had an experience that came from heaven and I will not 
not be satisfied until I get to live there. I know heaven is real because I have a longing for it. And I could not long for something that does not exist. You see, all my life I've heard about the coming of the Lord. And especially when I was a young boy. We preached about the coming of the Lord. I mean, every service. When we were growing up, I mean, I don't know how it was here. I mean, I got the Holy Ghost when I was five because I was afraid. <laughs> I got baptized when I was six. I, I'll never forget. My dad wouldn't let me get baptized because he wanted me to understand what I was doing when I got baptized. I'm like, well, I understood enough to get the Holy Ghost, you know. But he wanted me to really understand what baptism was about, so he made me wait. And I mean, I was so afraid I was going to miss the rapture, I finally went to my dad at six, when I was six years old. Dad, please, can I get baptized? Okay, I think you're ready. I mean, this is how we would end every service. Service will be here next Wednesday night if the Lord tarries. Every altar call was, sinner friend, you may never have another chance. <laughs> all, of our, all of our dramas at the church were dramas about the coming of the Lord. You know the one where the lights go out and you hear this? And then the lights come back on and there's like shoes and <laughs> pants and shirts. And then there's like one girl running through the room going, ah, ah, I missed it, I missed it. And then someone steps out, sinner friend, right now is your chance. <laughs> we had evangelists come by and they would tell us, you know, all these stories, show these slideshows and man, these pictures of Russian tanks, you know, and, and carrying these huge... 20 megaton nuclear weapons and then and then they would tell you those stars that you looking at out in the sky the ones that don't twinkle those are not stars those are satellites and they've got 20 megaton nuclear weapons that are pointed at every major city in america <laughs> bye bye sinner friend jesus is about to come i used to cry myself to sleep at night i'm, I'm serious man because, you know, I didn't know enough. He's come for those who watch for him. So I thought that, man, if you were asleep, you know, he's coming as a thief in the night. So I used to pray, God, wake me up before you come. I'd have those experiences at the mall. You know, when I got a little bit older, my mom would let me wander around at the mall. Meet me back here at 830, you know. Well, at 8.30, I'm, I'm standing there waiting on mom, you know, and mom's not there. Oh, Jesus, 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 Jesus. I came home from school one day, and my mom worked a little job, and my dad, of course, was busy at the church. He was a pastor. My sisters were older than me, quite a bit older than me, so they were not around, you know, until supper time. And so I come home. It was usually normal for me to have about an hour at home. There's no problem. I mean, I was old enough. I'd make a sandwich or I'd play with the dog or whatever, you know, no problem. And uh, but it was about 4.30, 5 o'clock, and it was early winter time, so uh, the sun sets really early in the day, and it's like 5 o'clock, and the sun's going down, and it's dark, and mom and dad are supposed to be home. And nobody's home. And I'm thinking about all those messages about the Antichrist. <laughs> and taking the mark of the beast. And if you don't take the mark, you'll have to give your head. And well, God, just give me strength. To... No, I'm not, I'm, I'm not taking the mark. There's no way. And then I'm thinking, you can't buy or sell, you know, without the mark. And I, I, well, we got some canned goods. So I start looking at the canned goods. And the, I'm taking them out and I'm putting in the suitcase. And I'm in a suitcase. And I'm putting all my favorite things that I got in the suitcase. And, 
And then I'm thinking, well, wait a minute, if the rapture really took place, then I'm going to be here in the house by myself. I was, oh, God, I'll live in the basement. They won't even know I'm here. They won't come for me. Maybe somebody will be nice and they'll still give me food. And I thought, what am I doing? Wait a minute. Before I really believe the rapture is taking place, I'm going to call Grandma. Because I know Grandma went into rapture. I know she's saved. And so if Grandma's not home, then I'm really worried. And Grandma didn't have an answering service. So I called, and it rang 16 times. <laughs> Nobody answered. Now I'm really panicking. Wait, I'll call the church. Maybe somebody's at the church that's still right with God. And so I call, and it rings like eight times, and I'm just about to hang up. I'm almost in tears. I'm like hyperventilating. <laughs> Jesus, 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 Jesus. <laughs> and my dad answers. And he had that golden tone. Bethel Tabernacle. And I said, Dad! And my dad heard it in my voice. And he just kept on going. Leave a message at the sound of the tone. <laughs> and he said, the rapture has already taken place and you've been left behind. And since there will no longer be services here, you can leave a message and I'm sure some kind soul will try to help you out. And I mean, my heart is pounding. I'm going, no, dad, no. And then my dad goes, <laughs> <laughs> my dad says to me, he goes, got a little sin in your life, son? <laughs> Something you need to tell your mother and I that you've been doing that we don't know about? Some reason why you thought you might not go in the rapture? Yeah. And I'm, well, not really, Dad. And, well, what does not really mean? Well, I mean, you know, I've, I've, I've been repenting. I've been praying. Well, son, what are you worried about? Dude, I don't know. You guys just weren't home. My dad comes, my dad comes home that, that, that night. And, of course, I'm feeling better now. But uh, he talks to me. He said, son, he said, why all this fear? The Bible says, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. This ought to be something that you're excited about. He's coming as a thief in, a night, in the night for those that are not ready. That doesn't mean because you're not thinking about him. That means you're not saved. If you are really right with God and, and you're living right, you're praying, you're walking with God... That ought to be something that you're excited about. You're going to get to go to heaven. And so he began, to, he began to talk to me about changing my perspective. Do you realize the New Testament church had a, a fundamental doctrine of rapture readiness? That's why Paul, when he wrote the code language in the end of, the, of his epistles to the Corinthians, he said, if any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema. Okay, then he puts a code word in the text, which doesn't belong at this place because it doesn't fit the context. He says, Maranatha. What he was saying is, I am proving that this is an authentic letter that came from me by giving you the code word of what we speak to each other when we are trying to get in a secret entrance. When they hid in the catacombs, they would use the word Maranatha and they broke it in half. And that they would say half of the word when they knocked on the door and they would say the other half of the word when they answered. And so they would knock on the door and they would say, Maran. And the other one say, Ata. Maranatha, Maranatha. And so he would say, Maran. And they would say, Ata, open the door. And then they would celebrate. Maranatha means come, Lord Jesus. It was a fundamental doctrine in the church that they were constantly looking for the glorious appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when they were in persecution and when they were hiding, this was their hope. This is what kept them going. This is what their excitement was. Maranatha, Jesus is coming. Maranatha, let's rejoice. Maranatha, hey! It's something to be excited about. Comfort each other with these words. Someday we're not going to have pain. Someday we're not going to have suffering. Someday all of our battles are going to be won. Someday we're not going to have diagnoses from the doctors that we don't like. We're just going to be with Jesus. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Hallelujah.
Maranatha. Touch somebody and say, come Lord Jesus. Let's clap our hands to the Lord again and give him praise. Have a little rapture practice here tonight. Maranatha! But that rapture preaching and that thought of Jesus coming, that excitement about, whew, get ready. Boy, that worked really good for evangelistic purposes for a long time. And then it kind of got wore out. 1984, he was supposed to come, and he didn't come. And then we had a book, 88 Reasons Why He's Coming in 88. <laughs> yeah, that was a book. And we all read it, and I mean, I'm telling you, there were people that came in by the droves, by the hundreds, and got baptized, and backsliders came in, and boy, it was just euphoria. Oh, Jesus is coming. I remember it was on one of the three dates, September 12th, 13th, or 14th, and Wednesday night service was the 13th, and everyone said, surely it's tonight. People were, were practicing on what, what they were going to wear on the night of the rapture. And I, I was like, oh, this is ridiculous. This is, like, he's not going to come now. I know he's not. No man knows the day nor the hour. And then he came up with another book. I missed it by one year. 89 reasons why he's coming in 89. <laughs> and then we had the Jerusalem Covenant, which we call the Jerusalem Covenant, 1993. And Yitzhak Rabin and, and, and uh, Yasser Arafat and, and, and President Bill Clinton were there. And they all shook hands. And that was this big moment. And signed this Jerusalem Covenant. And, 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 and it's seven years before the year 2000. Whew. Seven year tribulation going into the millennial reign. Jesus is coming shortly. <laughs> and nothing happened. And then 99 was the year of the meltdown. Y2K. The whole world is going to melt down because the computers didn't get programmed right. And bloop, nothing happened. I mean, we didn't even have to change a light bulb. I mean, there was nothing. Everyone fixed it. We fixed it all. It's done. And then 2001, September 11th. And that's supposed to have shook the world. And you know what? After a while, we were just numb. I mean, it was 30 days, and everyone's like, why are the lines so long at the airport? What's all the security? And everyone's still hyperventilating, you know? over these terrorist things and a few more terrorist actions and then we go into Iraq and we do all this things and things are happening in Spain and things are happening around the world and we're hearing Middle East stuff but you know what people are numb they're just totally numb didn't even face the world can't use it as evangelistic purposes not very much maybe just a little but people are not just all up in arms you know, there's, you know what this is the way the world is deal with it I got a life to live I got a job I'm not gonna worry about it as long as it's not directly affecting me and here we are 2008 and when was the last time you heard someone talk about the coming of the Lord when was the last time you heard a community of believers that were just excited about Jesus is coming it's almost dropped off the radar completely can I tell you something? He's still coming. He's still coming. The best is yet to come. But here's where we've missed it. We keep, we keep, and especially, especially prophecy preachers. You know, I remember we used to have this guy that would do Daniel's 70th week, 70 weeks, and he had this big chart, and he would stretch it off across the whole platform. You probably have never had one of those. You really don't need to get one of those, okay? I mean, and it would be a series that would last the whole summer. I'm like, Dad, how many more weeks of Daniel are we going to have to study? Oh, Dad, well, son, we're, you know, we're only on week 32. You know, I'm like, oh, 70 weeks, you know. I mean, I was in despair after I was uh, hearing all this stuff. It was so fatalistic as if there was no hope in the Antichrist and everyone's going to be deceived and we're going to walk around like zombies. And, you know. <sighs> and so the prophecy preachers are constantly looking for some kind of thing that's happening in the world to, to draw a parallel so they can find it in the book of Revelations and say, Who? See that? Look at that right there. There it is. And so we keep our waiting for wake-up calls Wake up calls, wake up calls, wake up calls. But we're missing the whole point of this message. 
that Jesus gave to the apostles. He said that there would be a wake-up call to the bride from the bridegroom's chamber. And this would be a point, watch this now, when a door would be opened and the anointing would be released. Now the Bible says that once they went in to where the bridegroom was, the door was shut. So that means at midnight, the door was opened. So there was a period at midnight when the door opened and the wise virgins got up, trimmed their lamps, and walked to the bridegroom. The bridegroom went and got the bride. And they all together walked into the bridegroom's house. And then the door shut. Okay? So what this is talking to us about is the last great segment of time in which all prophetic words are fulfilled before the coming of the Lord. It is when he does a quick work in the earth. It is an acceleration of all things that he has been working on since the foundation of the world. And he said, you need to be prepared and ready for this. But the wake up call is not from the world. It is not an earthquake. It's not a fire. It's not a terrorist attack. It's from the bridegroom's chamber. This is an in-house issue. The world doesn't know anything about this. Because this is not a message to the world. It is a message to the bridegroom. From the bridegroom to the bridesmaids representing the bride. What he said is there's a period of dormancy where they'll all slumber and sleep. But then there's going to be a wake-up call where I am going to speak a word that says you need to be prepared for the next stage. I am getting ready to wrap things up right now and it's time to start moving. Get your candles burning bright. Move forward. Walk towards this open door. And you and me have got some work to do to finally get this bride all ready and prepared. And then we're going to walk through this door together. Then the rapture is going to come. So before there is a door opened for, we, for us to be raptured, there's going to be a door opened in the earth for Jesus to manifest himself one last time and for there to be a great harvesting of souls and for every word that he prophesied through the prophets since the world began and everything that Calvary purchased will then be enacted in the earth. Oh, you say, well, Brother Cisco, do you really have Bible for that? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> Open your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 3, 19 through 21. I won't read it, I'll quote it. You can follow along and see if I'm saying it right. This is King James Version. Repent ye therefore and be converted. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. Am I, am I saying it right? Whom the heavens must receive. Until when? Until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Jesus Christ cannot come back until all the prophetic words are fulfilled. So people say, well, isn't there going to be a great falling away in the world? That means the sense of morality. The falling away is not people falling away from the church. That's a great falling away of, of the moral compass of human beings. That all of the traditional structures that have been put into the world are going to diminish and fall apart. And that's the only way that people will enter into deception. But watch this. That's also the only way people will break away from their traditions and accept a new revelation and walk into the fullness of truth. So while the Antichrist system is forming in the earth and while the devil is getting ready to deceive, we're going to stand right there with the power of the 
the Holy Spirit and demonstrate the anointing of the Holy Ghost and people that would have never been open to it a generation ago are going to be open now. Hindus and Muslims and, and, and Krishnas and people that would never leave it. Never, this young generation is not loyal. There is something different about this generation. There is not the same buy-in. We don't see Catholics that are as loyal to the Catholicism. We don't see Baptists that were as loyal to Baptists. We don't see Methodists that were as loyal. And you know what? And Pentecostals won't be loyal just because it's our tradition. But there's going to be a revelation. There's going to be something that's opening up in the Holy Ghost. There's going to be a door open. There's going to be a voice from heaven. There's going to be a fresh oil that's going to be released. And everybody that's been anticipating it and waiting for it is going to get up and wake up. And the church is going to be what it's always been meant to be from the foundation of the world. What Jesus saw when he was on the cross is finally going to exist. Upon this rock, I will build my church. I asked the Lord one day, I got very bold. I said, Jesus, is the church that's in existence now the church that you died for? Is this what you envisioned on the cross? You gave everything for your church. Are we living up to your expectations? I said, Jesus, if this is what we were meant to be, then just leave us as we are and tell us we're okay. But Jesus, if there is more, if we can have more, if we can do more, if we can accomplish more, if Calvary purchased for us a higher level of living, if we're beneath our privilege, then God, do whatever you have to do. Shake us up. Turn us upside down. Get a hold of us until we access everything that Calvary purchased, until we are the people that you called us to be, until we have the grace in our midst that will transform us. Stop and lift your hands to the Lord right now. I receive it. What I came to tell Tabernacle of Joy tonight is this. The wake-up call was sounded. The wake-up call has been sounded to the church. 2007 was the wake-up call. The reason why we had sleepless nights, the reason why we went through pain and through suffering, the reason why we've been distracted and frustrated and disappointed and confused and wandering around saying, what is going on? Is God is saying, I refuse to leave you like you are. I'm trying to get your attention. I'm putting you into scenarios that the only way out is on your knees. This is an in-house thing. This is happening all around the world. People that I talk to all around the world. I have polled people. How many of you have had more sleepless nights in 2007 than you can remember? Hands up. Congregations have 50, 60, 70 percent. I'll ask them, how many of you had a sleepless night this week? 60, 70 percent raised their hand. I'm like, what do you think this is? There wasn't a terrorist attack. There wasn't a national there wasn't some big calamity that's happened in your life. It's things that are going on. It's, it, it's an in-house thing. God is saying, hello, I'm here. And I'm getting ready to do something awesome right now. A door is open. You see, first thing that happens is the door opens. Now, if it's midnight and there's no light and a door opens, there's light inside of the house. So when that door opens, you see the outline of the door. The door opens. Then you hear a voice. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. <sighs> time to wake up. Time to get up. There's the door. And at this point, I am defined. When the door opens, I am defined. 
Am I made for this moment or not? Is this what I've been built for? Is this what I've been anticipating? Midnight is here. Yes. The door is open now. Woo. It's going to pull the best out of me. I'm going to have to marshal all of my energy and my strength. If this was just any other night at midnight and somebody just came and tried to wake me up, well, I wouldn't bother. But you see, this only happens once. And I'm representing the bride. And that bridegroom's counting on me. And it's time to go. And they reach to their vessels and they pull the seal off the vessel. And the smell of the oil. And the foolish virgins go, oh, 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 oh. What are we going to do? Uh, give us some of your oil. Oh, this shows their character. This reveals what they've been doing all along. They've just been siphoning off of other people around them. They've been counting on somebody else to be prepared. Somebody else to be consecrated. Somebody else to pray. Somebody else to hear somebody else to know and they got away with it and all the while they ridicule people and they say why are you carrying that vessel around with you that's not necessary look I mean, my candles burning bright yours is burning bright what's the difference it's all light it's all oil why you got this extra oil it's unnecessary you see when things are kind of dormant you say fivefold ministry, gifts of the Spirit, not necessary. Worship and praising God and all this morning prayer and all this wanting to hear from God and wanting to go deeper and evangelism and, and souls and harvest and leadership training and missions trips and giving all this. What is all this really about? I mean, can't we just be happy? In the period of dormancy, it's just, they even ridicule the, the anointing and they, and they, and they kind of try to diminish the dependency upon the spirit because we're operating inside of, uh, of an anointing that was enough. It was enough to walk us through this time. It was enough to get us here. But unfortunately, it's not enough to get us where we need to be. And so what we recognize is that the wake-up call is God recalibrating us for the future. And that there is an anointing that has been among us, but has not been accessed. That there has been this knowledge that there was more, but it has not been released yet. Because it coincides with something that happens in heaven. As in heaven, so in earth. So when God opens the door and he starts the quick work, then you can expect he's going to release another level of the Spirit of God. And he's going to release another anointing. What I came to tell you is, get ready for a fresh anointing from God to take us where we have been destined to go from the foundation of the world. Tabernacle of joy, God has set you in a position where you would be distinguished from other people, where you would be separated from other movements and even from other churches, where people will know that there's foolish virgins and there's wise virgins. There's people that are poised for the future and people that are going to be forever lost in the past. And right now, God is drawing a line and he's saying, I'm about to release you into a whole nother level, a spiritual door, a porthole in heaven is open. And now an anointing that has been among you, an anointing that has walked in your midst but you haven't totally been able to access God says now is the time that I'm going to release it and turn it loose and what they thought was unnecessary what they thought was not important you will find is the thing that will carry us to where we need to go it is absolutely essential Fivefold ministry is not just an option. The gifts of the Spirit is not a take it or leave it proposition. This is something that we have to have to navigate all the woes that are coming upon this earth. 
we are dealing with issues we are facing spirits we are having to, to, to confront stuff in our culture that we have never faced and never dealt with before in this knowledge intensive age and without the Spirit of God speaking in our ears, and without the power of the Holy Ghost, and without wisdom and revelation, without miracles, it is going to be impossible for us to move forward. But at the time of the wake-up call, you see what happens. People go in opposite directions. The foolish are given a message. If you want oil go buy it can you watch people whose flame has gone out stumbling in the darkness away from the people who have the light groping in the darkness I hope we can find somebody I think this is where we go I think this is where they're, where they're, they're going backwards they're walking into irrelevance. They're missing all the major moments. They're defined by the past. Their greatest moment has already been lived. You know what? I was there for the engagement. But you weren't there to see the bridegroom. You weren't there to see the excitement on her face. You weren't there to walk through the door because you were at the marketplace trying to get it together. Now, all of a sudden, it's important. Now, all of a sudden, oh, yeah, now I need it. I, I, I need a vessel, and I need some oil, and, and where can I buy it? And i got to hurry up, and, and I'll tell you what. There's a lot of people that have just kind of limped along and thought it was enough. But Jesus is not coming back for some docile, sickly, anemic bride languishing on some sick bread. Just hopefully holding out until Jesus comes back. <laughs> Help us, Lord. It was a foolish virgin mentality that wrote songs like, Hold the Fort. It's an old song in the song books I used to read. I used to get these song books out just for fun and just look through some of these song books. And I say, Mom, what is this song? Oh, we don't sing that one. I'm like, well, praise God, we don't. <laughs> Hold the fort for I am coming, coming back to take my people home. Hold the fort. Hold the fort. Like, incoming. <laughs> Hold the fort. We got some Christians that are like that. You know, we used to hear people testify like this. You know, oh, today was just a horrible day on my way to church. You know, <laughs> had a flat tire and I almost got run over when I was trying to get it out of the back. And the devil's been after me. Bless his holy name. <laughs> Y'all just pray for me that I make it all the way. And they sit down. And that was supposed to be a testimony. <laughs> some people, you don't ask them how they're doing. You don't want to know. Folks, this is, not, this is not the image of the bride that Jesus died for. Who is this coming out of the wilderness, leaning on the side of her beloved, fair as the sun and beautiful as the moon and terrible as an army with banners? This bride is coming out adorned with holiness, gloriously filled with the power of the Spirit, anointed with fresh oil, power and might and signs and wonders. And they that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. We are going to walk through this world with the glory of the power of the Holy Ghost and there's going to be a Jesus name movement that is going to shake every nation because the Bible says he's going to cover the earth he's going to cover the earth with his glory as the waters cover the seas he said afterwards it shall come to pass I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh he said the former rain is nothing compared to the latter rain I'm going to give you the former and the latter rain together if you thought the book of Acts was great you just wait till we get to Acts 29 Wait till we get to the last chapter. He's still writing church history. And you and I have our names on it. We're going to be right in the middle of it. 
Oh, God. Clap your hands to the Lord and give Him praise. Coming to the forefront are those that have been prepared. You see, what you have to recognize is that our attacks, the demonic attacks, the pain, the frustration, the confusion, and then all of the things that the enemy has done to retaliate against us while we have been in this static state of waiting. You see, the foolish virgins are happy. The wise virgins are nervous. Because they're living with anticipation. They're tolerating now. They're not happy now. I mean, they're, they're content. But, but I wasn't made for this. I wasn't made for the sleeping in the slumbering stage. I was made for, let's get on with it stage. Do you understand what I'm saying to you right now? This restlessness inside of you. God, I know we're having a good church and I, I love everybody. and This is wonderful, but God, there's something in me. That, something that's waking up inside of me. There's... God, when are we going to get to use all this anointing? When are we, when are we going to get to see the prophecies fulfilled? When is it all going to happen the way you said it was going to happen, God? I, I remember, it, and, and I'm bringing us to our point of prayer in just a moment. But I remember many, many years ago I preached in this church that had about a building that sat about 300 and they had about 30 people their glory days had gone church was about to close they had me for an evangelist to come and preach in hopes that I could kind of stir them up a little bit when I kind of surveyed you know the the church the vultures were circling you know this, this was, it was about to die. You could feel it. It was like you could smell death when you walked into the church. There was no excitement. There was no energy. The people were just like, well, you know, when are we not going to be able to pay for the building anymore? You know, I wonder who's going to get it. I mean, there was, people were talking like this. The pastor was just, he was already working a job and he, he was already prepared. Something happened. He was just going to, you know, just probably get out of the ministry or whatever. But let's have, let's young evangelists and see what he'll do. So I came, I figured I have nothing to lose. I'm going after it. So I did, and I mean, the Holy Ghost came in there and helped all of us. That's the only way I know how to describe it. We had miracles in this revival. We had things happen. There was this young boy, I'll never forget him. He, we didn't have, they didn't have aisles to run, really. They had a place on the side and you could go around the back, but there was no, there was no place in the back of the church to continue. So you have to go out in the lobby and then run through the lobby, and then come through another door, and then run back into the church. And this boy would run laps like this, and boom. And the ushers are back there like, my God, what's going on with the boy? And he's running through the lobby. And, he and then he would just fall out and lay on the floor and go, Jesus, 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 Lord. And he would just flap his arms. He looked like a fish that was out of, out of the water on the deck, you know, just flopping around. And, 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 and people kind of thought it was a little unusual, but of course I was unusual too, and they figured, well, kind of maybe goes with the revival. I don't know. But, and we had, a, we had a man that was missing a bone in one of his feet and couldn't walk right, and God put the bone back in his foot. We had a lady that had crippling arthritis in a wheelchair. She got up out of her wheelchair and rocked around the entire church. And we, we had several miracles. We had many people get the Holy Ghost, so six or seven in a church of 30 or 40 people, and seven get the Holy Ghost. That's a bunch. You know, it's like, how much growth, percentage of growth is that? You know, 10% or... 20%? I guess if you have 30 people, that'd be 20% growth, right? Okay, um, which is pretty good. But the pastor's son was uh, the sound man. And uh, he didn't really like me too well. But the pastor had a job, and so the uh, pastor's son had a job too. So they took turns on their lunch hour feeding me. So it was the pastor's son's job to take me out. 
on like Friday. And I'd been there a couple of days and we'd already had some things happen. And he looks at me across the table and he goes, he goes, I, I, I don't understand you. He said, you're kind of weird. You come into church talking in tongues and you talk about all this gifts of the spirit stuff. I've never heard anything about this before in prophecy and you want to give people words and what is all this about? I think it's a little unnecessary. And I looked at him and I said, what's your dream? He goes, well, what do you mean? I said, no, what's your dream? What do you dream about? When you pray or when you close your eyes or when you just meditate or you think about the future, what do you dream? He says, well, I have a good job. My wife has a good job. We live in a nice house. He said, I drive a brand new car. She drives a brand new car. We buy clothes, clothes, whatever we want. I wear nice shoes. I got nice ties. He said, we take vacations every year. He said, I got what I want. I said, that's the difference between you and me. You're happy with your life. I just tolerate where I'm living. I said, if I thought this is all there was to God and the church, I would get out of the ministry. If what we are seeing in the body of Christ is all there's ever going to be, I would be in despair because I cannot stand thinking that there's this many millions and billions of people on planet earth that have never heard the gospel and the church is in this kind of condition. I said, I believe in something better that's coming. I live every day with a dream of a worldwide revival. I live every single day of my life with this passion that's burning in me. Of thousands of people getting the Holy Ghost, miracles and signs and wonders, whole churches that are coming into the truth and getting baptized and being filled with the Holy Ghost. I said, this is what I live for. I get up in the morning with it. I, I go to sleep at night with it. I said, I have this passion. I have this drive. I said, that's why I am the way that I am. That's why I preach the way I preach. That's why you think I'm a little bit weird because I have a dream. You see, those of us here tonight that are feeling what I'm talking about, we understand that we have just been tolerating the, tolerating the season. You know why? Because we know there is a better day coming. And I came to tell somebody that better day is happening now. 2008 is the time when we transition where the church is coming out of its dormancy where we are walking through a brand new doorway in the spirit I came to tell you the door is already open this door that Jesus told us would open before his coming that door has opened and the dividing line will be clearly seen this year 2008 there will be a clear dividing line between those going in the right direction towards the door and those walking out into oblivion never to be relevant again. This young man talked to me after the service on Saturday. We had two more nights. That Friday night, something got a hold of him. He couldn't shake it. What's my dream? He went to sleep that night for the first time, discontent. He started thinking, he talked to his wife. I, I don't have a dream. He said, Brother Jason, just, he said, he asked me, what's my dream? He said, he shook me. He said, I, I wasn't expecting somebody to ask me that. He said, I, 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 I need to get a dream. How, how do you get one? And he started praying. He fell back on his face. And then he started watching a little closer when I was praying for people and when people were coming down to the altars. And, 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 and he, he came to me, tears streaming down his face. He said, do you think there's hope? Do you think God could give me a dream? Do you think God could use me? How do you think God could use me? And I said, well, I said, you know, I told him a few things. And I just, I didn't know how deep his hunger was and how serious he was. On Sunday night, the last service, he came to me, him and his wife. He said, we've talked about this. And he said, we, after what we've seen and what we've felt, he said, I want what you've got. He said, you've heard of Elijah and Elisha? I said, yeah. He said, that's what I want. But I want a double portion. <laughs> I looked at him. And he said, so I want you to lay your hands on me and my wife and pray for me. Pray for us. I said, do you know what you're asking for? 
I think so, yeah. I said, are you willing to pay the price? I said, it will cost you everything. And he looked at me broken. I'll still see those eyes. Whatever it costs. I don't want to be left behind. I want to have what God wants me to have. I got to have it. I said, okay, Lord, you heard it. This is not my anointing. It's your anointing. Lord, he said he wants it. Here it comes. I laid my hands on them at the same time. He fell this way. She fell that way. And they laid on the floor. She balled up in a, in a fetal position underneath the pew, sobbing and travailing and groaning. He fell the other way, just out in the spirit, talking in tongues. And I went back up to the front, and another lady stepped out, and she said, I've been watching you this week. And she said, I have a children's ministry. She said, but I haven't really done what I should have done for God. She said, but I stepped out because I want what you've got. Can I have it? And I said, I'll... I'll, I'll you can have it. Anybody can have it. I said, are you willing to pay the price? I said, it's going to cost you everything. She said, she said, that's what's missing. She said, I have not been willing to give him everything until now. She said, but I've been miserable just holding back anyway. So I'm ready to totally surrender. I'm ready. She said, I've got such a burden. I, these kids, they need me. They need somebody. There's so many kids that need help. And I said, okay. Are you ready? She said, I'm ready. Lord, you heard her. It's not my anointing. It's your anointing. But she said she was willing. Here it comes. I laid my hand on her. Same thing. She hit the floor. All three of them were out for over an hour. The man who fell out, the pastor's son, became the pastor of the church. Within a year, the next Easter, the next Easter, they had over 100 people there in their church. They went from 30 to over 100 in one year. God did an awesome work in that man's life. This woman fell on the floor. She now travels the United States and even different parts of the world. Her and her husband have a children's ministry that has people get the Holy Ghost in such great numbers. It's just awesome. She has had over 6,000 children receive the Holy Ghost over the last several years. God did it. Here's the reality. The door is open and we have to have the anointing that corresponds with that door. That is what I call the anointing for the future. What God told me in 2007, he says, I calibrated you for the future. He said, if you fight the changes that I'm making in your life and you try to go back to how things were, he said, you will live the rest of your life frustrated because things will never be as they were. So God is calibrating us for what's coming. And there is an anointing that was made to deal with what's coming. Where we will actually thrive in the middle of what's happening in the world. Just as Joseph had the keys to the storehouse and the famine only allowed him to tell the story of the dream and how God showed him and give great glory to God. And while everyone else was starving, he's got the keys to the storehouse and he's eating steak every night. And the whole world comes to his feet. So I believe that God has been preparing people just for this moment so that the whole world can come to where the grain is, where the corn is, to those who have been given keys for this future. Churches that have been prepared for this, for the unlocking of this anointing. Do you want that anointing to be released upon you? Do you want it? If you want it, I want you to stand to your feet right now. 
I want you to lift your hands and I want you to begin to tell the Lord. I'm ready, Lord. I'm hungry. I want it, Lord. Go ahead and clap your hands to the Lord now and give Him praise. Thank you, Jesus. We're getting our spirits in alignment for an impartation. We're feeling the seal come off of the vessel. And something awakening in our midst. An excitement, an anticipation. A door, a light. A revelation. A flow that we have never felt before. A new day dawning. A new thing God is doing. Now you said you wanted it. You've prayed with intensity of desire saying, God, I want it. Now here's the question. Are you willing to pay the price? Because nobody proceeds into this next dimension on somebody else's consecration. What they said to the foolish virgins is, we paid a price for this oil. It comes by the same price for you. No shortcuts. The impartation comes to those that are willing to pay the price. This is not popular preaching, but it's prophetic preaching. And if you want this impartation, God, I've got to have this anointing. I have got to be in the middle of what you are doing. I do not want to wake up one day and realize I've been a part of something that no longer matters, that is irrelevant, that is lost wandering in a darkness somewhere saying, what happened? I thought we were going to be X, Y, Z, and we are not. God, I want to be at the, I want to be on the cutting edge. I want to be right in step. The spirit and the bride say, come. That means we're going to be in total alignment, agreement. You are willing to pay that price to be there, to have that anointing, I want you to come and stand. Hallelujah. Come and stand.
Here it comes. By the authority of the Word of God and the power that's in the name of Jesus, heavens that have been opened. Now, Father God, because the heavens that have been opened, release the anointing. Now, release it. Release it upon them, Father. The anointing for the end times. The anointing to fulfill every promise. The, the anointing that Calvary purchased for now. The anointing for dominion. The anointing for apostolic authority and dominion in the entire Asia region. The anointing to be an Antioch for the 21st century. The anointing, God, release it now upon your people. The anointing for signs and wonders and miracles. The anointing to be caught up. The anointing to be lost in the spirit. The anointing to intercede. The anointing to walk through this world. That you come behind in no gift. That you, that you have all grace. I lift the lid off. I lift the lid off now. I unlock that which has been dormant in you. I activate the full measure of the grace of God in your life. As of this moment, now you will never be the same. Now clap your hands one more time to the Lord and give him a shout of praise right now. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! I release it. Now I'll tell you, I'll tell you what I want you to do right now. I just feel impressed to do this. I want you to take someone by the hand next to you and I want you just to dance for a minute. I just want you to begin to dance because the celebration is about to start. We're about to enter into the next phase of the ceremony. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Woo! We're getting ready to dance with the bridegroom. We're getting ready to dance with the bridegroom. I got it. I got it. I got the anointing. I've got the anointing. I've got the anointing. I have the anointing for the future. I have the anointing. You've got the anointing. We have got the anointing. It's in the house. It's here. This is it. This is the power that will take over the world. <laughs> 